Every time I try to make it on my own Every time I try to stand and start to fall And all those lonely roads that I've traveled on But there is Jesus When the life I built came crashed into the ground When the friends I had were nowhere to be found I couldn't see it then, but I could see it now But there was Jesus In the waiting, in the searching, in the healing, in the hurting like a blessing buried in the broken pieces Every minute, every moment Where I've been, where I'm going Even when I didn't know it Couldn't see it There was Jesus With a man who needs amazing kind of grace For forgiveness and a price I could pay And I'm not perfect so I thank God every day That there is Jesus There is Jesus In the waiting, in the searching, in the healing, in the hurting like a blessing buried in the broken pieces Every minute, every moment Where I've been, where I'm going Even when I didn't know it I couldn't see it There was Jesus In the valleys In the shadows of the alleys message this morning about God's amazing grace. It's found in Hebrews chapter 4, uh, verses 14 through 18, and more specifically in verse 16. You know, how many of you have ever worked a job and maybe someone, your boss or someone who is over in authority says to you, I want you to know as you begin this job, I always have an open door policy. You ever heard that expression? Which means... It's supposed to be an invitation to where anyone can come into that particular office at any given time because it's an open-door policy. I want you to think of this. The throne room of God is an open-door policy where God anticipates and expects us to approach Him at any time of the day with any need that we have, any concern on our heart. Why is that? Because His grace is sufficient to meet our every need, and His riches of glory are available readily to supply whatever needs we have. And that grace is God's powerful love that is such a mercy given to us that is beyond what we could ever even uh, imagine in our life. Now, I like to think of what this verse tells us, and we'll read it in just a moment, that 
when you have a need and I have a need, and it's almost as if we are making our way to God's throne, and if there were any distractions in heaven, all of, all of a sudden, just the one inkling of a thought of our moving toward God to his throne room, heaven becomes silent with great anticipation that one of God's chosen children, the son or daughter, is getting ready to approach God in his throne room because it's an open-door policy. And something's going to transpire between that person and God that is holy, that is amazing, that is powerful. A transaction will happen not that God needs to be changed, but we need to be changed and we need to be impacted. God's heart will be blessed when we, he receives all the praise because he inhabits the praise of his people, yes. But our hearts will be overwhelmed because of the communication that we have with Abba, Father our great daddy. All right, in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, it says, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, which we may obtain mercy and find grace in the time of need. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace in our time of need. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 4, Verse 14, it says this, putting it in its context. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to this confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who has been tested in every way as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, because of what has just been said and because of the confession that we have in our heart and because of what we know in whom Jesus Christ is, therefore, let us come boldly before the grace of God so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. The central figure of Christian faith is not some remote deity who's flawless, had a flawed spirit, or been with no understanding of human nature. That's not what we worship. If that were the case, then prayer would be terrifying and prayer would be meaningless. Fortunately for us as Christians, Jesus not only understands our struggles, he, only, he understands our failures. He has overcome them firsthand. And this verse is the conclusion of a point that began in verse 14 and after encouraging Christians to complete the works that God has given us, the writer reminds us that God's Word is the ultimate measuring stick for all our thoughts, all our deeds, all our intentions. Nothing is hidden. Nothing is obscured to God, who is the ultimate judge of all things. So therefore, knowing that very clear, we maintain the faith in the face of struggle, in the face of failure, we can approach God's throne with great boldness and great confidence because we know that without that throne room of God, there is no mercy, there is no grace to help us in our time of need. God expects us to say, Father, I need help. He expects us to, to bow on our knee and say to him, this is my problem. I can't handle it. This is the need of my life. I need your miraculous work. God expects us to cry out to him and request of him what only he can do. He expects us to have communication to him on a regular basis. He expects us to call him father. He expects us to call him daddy. He expects us to lay ourselves at his throne room because we know he knows we need mercy. We need grace more than we need it. We know we need it ourselves. You see, knowing then that Christ fully understands all our weaknesses, that he has experienced all our pain, we can pray to him. We can come to God asking for mercy, asking for help, asking for forgiveness. We can be confident and we can be assured in such prayer, in such dynamic. 
For Jesus is considered worthy of more glory than Moses, just as the builder has more honor than the house. That's what Hebrews chapter 3, verse 6 says. Nobody understands our pain better than Jesus, which is why only Jesus can be our high priest, as well as our only substitute for the payment of our sin. You realize that, that, that the confession that we believe, that Jesus is our high priest, that he is taking care of all of our spiritual needs, that that belief allows us the, the wonderful position of having that open-door policy to go to God at any time, any place, with any need, with any concern of our heart, and we place it at his feet. And we say to God, God, here it is. And I come boldly before you because I believe in you. I believe in what only you can do. I believe in what you can do with my life. And I believe that you can turn a bad situation into good. You can make a difficulty become something easy. You can change things in my life. And so I come before you because I need your help. And here it is. Mercy and grace is a gift to us. So why can we approach God's throne? Why can we actually approach God's throne? I want to give you a few things to think about. First of all is the fact that he redeems from sin. In him, in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7, it says this, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our sin according to the riches of his grace. You see, we have re reason why we can go to God is because we have been redeemed so that we can approach God. This verse transitions to the payment that Jesus made for us through his blood. And Paul is referring to Christ's death on the cross as the sufficient and only payment that's needed for our sins so that all of us who believe we have redemption and can come before the Redeemer. And we say to God, thank you, God, for saving my soul. When was the last time in all that you prayed? It's real easy to say, God, I got a difficult day here and I need some strength. It's easy to say, God, I have a problem and I need help. But how many times do we just go to God and just say, God, thank you for saving my soul? In Jesus' name, amen. What a wonderful gift that you have been given, that I have been given it is paid, we are paid for, we are released from the eternal penalty and the earthly power of our sins. This is freedom, freedom not to be free, but freedom to be free in him, if that makes sense. Since he paid for our sins by his death, it cost him everything, and we are given the gift of redemption. As a result, the believer the ultimate price has been paid. Now, this is by definition grace, the ability to become the child of God because God provided a free way to know him by faith. So he's opened the door. God's grace is mentioned in reference to, to money and many times with the idea of being the grace that is tremendous value. But we're not looking at it from a monetary standpoint. We're looking at it from such a wonderful understanding that you and I are sons and daughters of God, that all our sins have been forgiven because we all fall short of the glory of God, according to Romans 3.23. And because we fall short of his glory, he gives to us the opportunity. He opens the door and says, because of Jesus, or because I have redeemed your soul, I am allowing you the open door policy to come into my throne, to fellowship with me as a son and daughter unto the Father. Beautiful. Grace defined is God's unconditional, unearned, unmerited favor. And it's freely given. It is his unconditional love freely given to change, to transform, and to empower us for daily living. It's only through Christ that we have the way. As Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man gets to the Father except by me in John 14, 6. And that we have salvation. As Paul says in Acts chapter 4, uh, verse 12, he says this, There is salvation in no one else, 
For there is no other name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved. And that's Jesus. Therefore, it is that unconditional love that's given to us that saves our soul. And this explains the truth in greater detail by stating that the same grace of God which gives salvation is designed to also lead believers to work for God and to do all that he's asked us to do and accomplish for him. Because in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 through 10, it says, For by grace you are saved through faith, and this is not of yourselves. It is God's gift, not from works, so that no one can boast. For we are his creation, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time so that we should walk in them. Beautiful. It's all about grace. Grace greater than our sin. Grace is greater than that which is within you. The first verse of of amazing grace says this, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Kings, presidents cannot pardon our transgressions. Silver, gold cannot buy forgiveness. Medicine, science cannot produce a pardon. But Jesus Christ redeems our soul, and he redeems us from that sin. Jesus Christ, through the grace of God, can reach down into the gutter of despair, lift up the penitent soul out of the miry clay, and redeem his or her soul from destruction. And that's exactly what Ephesians 2 verse 8 says. It is for by the grace of God you are saved and given salvation. So therefore we can approach the throne of God because he has redeemed our souls. He has redeemed our sin. Number two of why we can approach God's throne is that he relieves our fears. I love what Psalm 56, 3 says. In the, day I, in the day I am afraid, I will trust God. Or if you want to look at it in more of an easier way to, to speak it, when the day comes and I am afraid and scared to my shoes all the way down, I will trust in God. When I am fearful of what is about to happen, I can trust in God. When the day comes in my life and I don't know what else to do and I feel scared and I feel like I am engulfed in such fear, I will trust in God. Whenever I'm afraid, I will trust in you, David says. This is the young man who killed the lion and the bear, who killed the Goliath, who was a successful young captain in Israel's army, and he did not deny the presence of fear in his life. There are times when he was afraid, yet he knew what to do with that fear, to boldly proclaim his trust in God despite the fear. It's because we can go to the throne room with confidence and boldness, and we know that God's grace is sufficient for our every need, and it is his grace that helps us to realize that we need not be in fear because we trust in him. He's trustable. He's trustworthy. We can give him all that we give him, and he can handle it. He's a big boy. He knows how to do it. In that day, I am afraid. It was a time of fear for for David, as it's recorded in 1 Samuel 21, verse 12, and you'll find that in that chapter. So believers have their times of fear just like David had his time of fear, a man after God's own heart. We have fear in our interest of love. We have fear wondering about grace. We have fear wondering if the covenant of God remains in our life. We have fear about our sins. We have fear about our corruptions. We have fear about facing what we may have to face and perish. We have fear of our enemies. We have many, many lively fears and are strong and real. But we do not have to fear because we trust in thee. We trust in God. Trust and confidence in the Lord is the best antidote a fear. It is God who is unchangeable in his love and whom is everlasting strength, who is faithful and true to every word of promise. Therefore, there is great reason to trust in God Almighty and not be afraid. 
The second verse of that hymn of Amazing Grace says, "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed." Today's world is full of fear. Many are afraid to live. Many are afraid to die. Many have riches they're afraid of. Many have poverty, afraid of youth, afraid of old age. God's amazing grace relieves us of those fears. Since God is love, the more of him we know, the less fear we possess. And that is according to 1 John chapter 4, verse 18. So understand why we can approach God's throne, because he has redeemed our souls. He's redeemed us from our sin. He has relieved our fears. And third of all, he reassures us through danger. Psalm 91, verse 11. I think, Judy, one of your favorite psalms. For he will give his angels orders concerning you to protect you in all your ways. Now, when you and I are going through danger, you got to picture this. You got, you, God's got to punch a couple of angels to the side and say, listen, Donna needs help. Kim needs help. They're living in danger. Now get off your wings and get down there and help them. I've given orders concerning, char- given orders to the angels concerning you to help you in your face of danger. So we're never alone. So we have an open door policy. We have an also an open door angel policy that's there in our life. God says, you're welcome to my throne as I am welcomed into your life and I'm going to provide for your every need. So we can approach him because we know that he has our life in his hands. Every verse of scripture needs to be understood in its proper context. In this passage, the psalmist has celebrated the Lord's incredible ability to protect his people. And this is a part of God's ability, and it does not mean that God absolutely guarantees health and safety every day of our life, who demands it. In contrast, even in the present psalm that he's speaking, in present day reality, is that in the midst of life's dangers, God is with us to reassure us through that danger, his presence is real. Satan will attempt to twist these very words when he tempted Jesus even. It's recorded in Matthew chapter 4, verse 5 and 6, where he came up to Jesus and he answered, It is written, Man must not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple. And he said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will give his angels orders concerning you. See how he's twisting the scriptures? And they will support you with their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. And Jesus says, "Mm, do not test the Lord your God. So understand that even in this context, the implication is that the words written here could be applied as a demand to God. No. That if Jesus jumped off this building, that God would be obligated to help him. No. Jesus rejected that interpretation. That pointing out that the other parts that are very important is that we cannot test the Lord our God. And he rejects the devil's improper use of the words. And he recognizes that when the time comes, he voluntarily lays his life down on the cross so that we could be, so that the thousands of angels could even have been summoned to his care. And if the thousands of angels could be summoned to his care, how much can one angel do in your life and mine? Because he's given orders concerning us that we will be protected in the face of danger. Angelic servants are one of the ways in which God acts in the world. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14, it says this, ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation. No doubt, believers may not be fully aware of the ministry of angels. It's possible that God allows them to intervene on our behalf. Was this by accident? The other day, I'm heading down the highway. I'm going out the door. I have my keys in hand. I've got my my water bottle in hand. I've got my Bible in hand. I'm heading to my appointment. And all of a sudden, I realize, oh, my, 
I forgot to do something. So I go back in there, type a little bit on the computer, send out an email, just enough to cause about three minutes to four minute delay. When I get off of 31 and turn on the 544, there is a huge crash. Huge. Obviously, life is being threatened in this crash. Three minutes before, I could have been in the crash. You ever thought about, is that an accident? No. Is that God's orders that he's given to his angels to protect me in the face of danger? Could possibly be. So, again, God reassures us, and we can approach God's throne because of that reassurance. That third verse of amazing grace is, Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I already come. To his grace has brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. Ours is a dangerous world. Yes, we know that. Without are storms, floods, thefts, murders. Within are trials, hurts, loneliness, and misunderstanding. God's amazing grace is sufficient for those who put their trust in him. Friends and loved ones may forsake us, but Jesus never fails. And that's Psalm 91, verses 14 through 16. And number four of why we can approach God's throne, because the rewards are eternal. Now, I love this verse in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. Therefore, get your minds ready for action. Being self-disciplined, set your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Some version says, gird up your mind. Get your mind ready for action, being self-disciplined, setting our hope that is completely rest upon the grace that is brought to us through the revelation of Jesus Christ. Having summarized the position and privileges of the believer in the glory of salvation, Apostle Peter exhorts Christians to live their lives in a godly manner, and he points out the responsibilities and duties are incumbent on all those who are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And one of those areas is to gird up our minds so that we're ready for every event that may overtake us in our Christian walk or even overpower us in our Christian walk or even over uh, just, just totally baffle us in our Christian walk. We are to gather up our thoughts, guard our thinking, to not permit our minds to wander from the truth of God's Word. A girded mind is one that is, that is ready for action. A girded mind is not easily influenced by ungodliness. A girded mind is not unsettled by any unbiblical or hostile worldview. Peter knew that when we are faced with difficulties, we're faced with dangers, our hearts become unsettled, our minds can become confused, but yet if we gird our minds, it is a mind that is composed. It is a mind that is calm. It is a mind that's full of peace. It is a mind that has strength in the Lord. A girded mind is one that is flooded with the peace of God in the face of difficulty. It is a heart not influenced by the taunts and the treatments of ungodly propositions because we understand that the rewards we have are not temporal, they're eternal. We're further urged to be self-disciplined, to be self-controlled, to be sober-minded, to be stable in our walk so that we're not easily tossed about by the winds of the waves. That we're to keep our eyes and our hearts trusting in God, our eyes looking to Jesus who's the author and the finisher of our faith, and our life that is submitted to the Spirit anchored on Christ who is the rock of our salvation. Every statement I just made were seven scriptures that I quoted you in that paragraph. But in the light of our present position, in the privileges that you have in Christ, we're given one further important step in our journey through life. We are to set our hope completely on the grace that will be brought to us at the revelation of Christ. We have an internal inheritance that is kept for us in heaven. We have the assurance Right here, this day, this hour, that the rewards are eternal, that already has begun, that will be eternal forever and ever. We have the assurance from God himself that Christ will one day return for his church. And we, will, we are to anchor our hope in that glorious truth. We are to rest securely on the hope of Christ's promise to return for his very own. 
the fourth verse of that hymn of Amazing Grace says, we, we, When we've been there 10,000 years, bright, shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Earth's treasures, earth's possessions, they're temporal. They wear out. They rust. They decay. God's amazing grace lasts forever. It is good to live by. It is good to die by. Christ is preparing a mansion for those who love him. He says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if, I, if it was not so, I would have told you. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I'm going to prepare that place, I will come back for you. And I will get you. And I will put you in the place that is full of glory. So the next time you approach the throne room of God, remember that your heavenly Father has already set before you everything eternal. You come to God confidently with great assurance because God's grace is amazing. So we can approach God's throne room because of redemption, because of relief, because of reassurance, because of rewards. We're redeemed from our sin. We are relieved of our fears. We are reassured through our dangers. And we are given rewards that are eternal. So when you approach God, you're approaching an open door room, a throne room that is full of gifts that's already been given. Why not just approach him and say, Father God, I've just come to spend time with you. I'm going to be silent, and I'm just going to worship in your silence, in your presence, because you're God. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for that amazing grace. Thank you for all that you've done for my soul. Thank you for the promise of abundant life that I live today. Thank you for the promise of everlasting life when I breathe the last air that I have on earth would just be the beginning of life eternally. That should excite us. That should make us just jump for joy. Are you in need of God's mercy? Are you in need of God's help today? Call on him. Don't be surprised when he meets your needs. Be full of amazement and honor and joy. Thanksgiving. God's a good God. And he's ready to give that goodness to you and me. Just ask him. Lord, I need help. And I need mercy. That's probably when he just says, thank you for asking. Because I'm just overflowing with mercy and help today. And I'm ready to lavish you. Father God, we call upon you. And we together approach you in great reverence, in great honor. And in all, to realize the fact that we're given the station and position of crying out and calling out and talking to the creator of the world. We're talking to the one who's died for us. And we thank you. We're talking to to the God who can perform miracles. Who can take the lame and, and... And give them feet to walk upon. Can take a a weary people in the face of danger in a Red Sea and part it. Can take a thirsty people and provide water through rocks. Can take a hungry people and provide food through fish and bread. Who can take an individual who's filled with all sorts of, of awfulness in her life. Going from dead-end relationship to dead-end relationship and give her living water. Lord, we approach you because we know that you're the God of all that has ever been and all that will ever be. Because you're the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And we cry out to you as Abba Father. Thank you for providing us the pathway to mercy. Providing us the gateway of grace, and all we have to do is request it. Thank you, God, for allowing us 
the moments we have to just experience you and experience your presence. Thank you for receiving us as wretched as we are and as dirty as we come, that you receive us and clean, clean our life up with your spirit. Thank you, God, for loving us all and providing us all this amazing grace. In your name that we pray, amen. Amazing grace, my chains are gone is the invitational hymn today. Let's sing this together. Sing it like we believe it. Let's stand. See 